Hello and welcome to EarlyMusicSources.com. My name is Elam Rotem, and today we'll have a look at Emilio de Cavalieri's mysterious and harmonic passage. In his revolutionary lamentation settings, composed sometime before the turn of the 17th century, Emilio de Cavalieri included some mind-blowingly expressive music. While much of the music is simply very chromatic, one little passage is labeled en armonico and seems to ask for something beyond chromatic, a division of the tone into five parts. In this episode, we will have a look at that passage, and with the help of Alice, Johannes, and Vicentino's enharmonic organ, we will also be able to hear it. Let's start. From his appointment to supervise all the arts at the Medici court in 1588 until his death in 1602, Emilio de Cavalieri was one of the leading figures in the development of the stile rappresentativo, the new style of music and performance that was key in the development of opera. His famous Rappresentazione di Anima e di Corpo from 1600 is a landmark in music history, and his piece O che nuovo miracolo from 1589 was the basis for no less than 128 pieces of instrumental music under different names. Otherwise, he composed also lamentation settings for the Holy Week. These are found in a manuscript, copied possibly after Cavalieri's death, which includes music for the Holy Week of different years, some are incomplete, and all seem to have been composed sometime before 1600. In terms of affects, appropriately matching the dark and somber texts of the Book of Lamentations, describing the destruction of Jerusalem and its people, much of the music is harsh and highly chromatic. But as opposed to other such music from that period, typically written for five or so voices, here, among traditional polyphonic sections, there are also monodies and duets with basso continuo, allowing for an even more dramatic and expressive result. In fact, this is the earliest known case of monodies and duets with basso continuo in the context of liturgical music. At the end of one of the settings, there is this monody. The text says, et ipsa oppressa amaritudine and she is in bitterness. Using a little sign, it seems that Cavalieri supplied three different endings for this phrase. The first optional ending, the second optional ending, and the third one. The first ending includes a chromatic ascent from C to D, while the bass moves around. Let's listen. Harsh, but fair. Not something we wouldn't expect from a composer interested in chromatic music as Cavalieri was. The second possible ending includes harsh and improper leaps of a diminished fifth and then an augmented second. Let's listen. These hard leaps, that would normally be simply forbidden or considered to be grave errors, are used here on purpose, to convey the harsh bitterness. But there is yet another version of bitterness according to Cavalieri. Above the third option there is the text enharmonico. This should not be confused with the modern use of the word enharmonic. Here it refers to the third genus of music as explained by the Greeks, who divided music into three genera, diatonic, chromatic, and enharmonic. 
Renaissance theoreticians were fascinated with the ancient wisdom of the Greeks, and some of them tried to apply it, somehow, to the music of their own time. One of the most notable surviving attempts was made by Nicola Vicentino, who in 1555 published a book called L'antica musica ridotta alla moderna pratica, ancient music adapted to modern practice. In the book, among many other things, he shows how one can compose music not only in the diatonic and chromatic genera, but also in the enharmonic one. This is done by including intervals that are smaller than the ones we normally use. Cavalieri almost certainly knew Vicentino and his ideas, and dealt himself with enharmonic organs. We even know that he commissioned such an organ for the specific purpose of accompanying monodies. Going back to the music, we see that the enharmonic third possible ending is a little bit similar to the first one. There is an ascent from C to D, but now, in between the C and C sharp, and C sharp and D, there are additional notes, notated with slashes and a dot. Vicentino, whom we mentioned before, did not use slash signs to notate his enharmonic alterations, but did use dots. Looking at the passage, it would make sense that the slash signs make the note higher by a certain small degree, putting it somewhere in between the conventional chromatic notes and that the dot makes the note somewhat lower, putting it somewhere between the C-sharp slash and the final D. It seems then that Cavalieri divided the tone into five parts. C, C slash, C-sharp, C-sharp slash, D dot, and finally D. Looking for the right tools to understand this division of the tone, Let's see how Vicentino divided it and put the enharmonic intervals into practice. According to conventions of the time, the tone can be divided into two unequal parts, one chromatic semitone and one diatonic semitone. This is the standard chromatic division of the tone in the 16th century, as opposed to nowadays where with the equal temperament all the semitones are equal. So if we apply this to Cavalieri's first ending, we have a chromatic semitone and then a bigger diatonic semitone. Let's listen. Vicentino divided these semitones further into smaller intervals called dieses. In the chromatic semitone there are two dieses, and in the bigger diatonic semitone, there are three. While we cannot be sure how Cavalieri saw the division of the tone, here is how his enharmonic passage is applied in Vicentino's division. And this is how it sounds. Interestingly, when Vicentino describes the enharmonic music, he connects it to sweetness, dolce e soave. But when Cavalieri utilizes it, he uses it in the opposite context, of bitterness and harshness. In addition to this theoretical discussion, Vicentino also describes new keyboard instruments that could play the notes of his system thereby serving as a foundation for the performance of polyphonic and harmonic music. Here in Basel, we are lucky to have access to the reconstructed enharmonic organ of Vicentino. There is much to say about this organ and what it can do, but for now, thanks to the fact that it has an enharmonic division of each tone, we can try and play Cavalieri's little enharmonic passage. Let's listen to Alice and Johannes.
It might be interesting to know that this phrase was never recorded in that way in modern times. In the two available recordings of the piece, the performers played the three optional endings one after the other, repeating the amaritudine more often than intended. In addition, the enharmonic passage was performed without being enharmonic. That is, the slashes and dot were ignored and the notes were sung as normal chromatic notes. These deviations from the source might be due to the addition that those performers used and the lack of recognition of the enharmonic signs and their meanings. Naturally, without instruments that can actually play such enharmonic notes, it would be impossible to execute this passage. But it is probably for this reason that Cavalieri supplied alternative options. This, of course, does not take away from the beauty and inspiration one may nevertheless take from these recordings. When referring to enharmonic organs, Cavalieri wrote to Luzzaschi that it is cosa nuova e molto difficile, something new and very difficult. Therefore, it is astonishing and a pity that despite the enormous effort surrounding the subject, all we have from Cavalieri is but a tiny phrase. This makes me a bit bitter. This was our show about Cavalieri's mysterious enharmonic passage. We hope you enjoyed it. Many thanks to Alice Borciani, Johannes Keller, and Vicentino's organ. Don't forget to check the special page on our website with all the footnotes and other extra information. If you enjoy early music sources, feel free to support us on Patreon. Comment, share, and like. See you next time at earlymusicsources.com.